message, God's calling uh, and God's molding and shaping your life uh, will be our focus today. Uh, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, we see Jesus standing outside, ironically, the seven churches uh, to whom he's speaking, and he's knocking at the door uh, in Revelation 3.20. We see uh, the scripture says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Uh, imagine that Jesus uh, outside the doors of the church, uh, outside the door of uh, a saved person's life knocking. Uh, and in that simple verse, uh, used for evangelism, calling somebody to open the door. Uh, it, there's a, a wealth of um, doctrine there that there's a door Jesus wants you to open. That same Savior, as he has risen from the dead and the disciples for fear lock the doors, uh, Jesus passes through uh, and into the room, uh, not needing a door. Why is Jesus knocking at a door uh, of uh, the saved person's life, knocking uh, on the door, the heart's door of the unsaved? There's, he's calling to you. When you hear that, that knock and you're sitting at home and you're watching TV, it's the UPS guy, you hear that and you know uh, somebody's got something for you. And so today we're going to look at God's calling, his continual drawing you uh, to a closeness. You know, I might say that I know the president or uh, I know the king. Uh, that's one thing. I, I know him. Uh, but if you say I have dinner with the president or I have dinner, that's entirely different. Uh, that closeness that he's drawing you to is a familiar closeness. We learn quirks about each other when we eat with each other, don't you? Uh, wow, no one ever taught that person to chew with their mouth closed. That's the worst. Uh, or how about, my goodness, did you see how much salt they dump on their whatever? Uh, God wants to be intimate with you. He doesn't want you to say, God, save me, and I'll see you someday. He's knocking continually come closer come closer so today I want you to consider uh, are you hearing God's drawing and are you responding let's pray Lord we love you I thank you for your holy word Lord I pray that um, as your Holy Spirit uh, and your word combine and work uh, in our minds and on our hearts Lord, I pray that we would be drawn willingly and even excitedly, Lord, closer to you. Uh, and what a place that is to be, Lord, near to you. Lord, bring us to that spot. Lord, may we leave and forsake anything needed. And might we cling to with uh, passion and need uh, that which we need to be uh, close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. In John uh, chapter 6, we see uh, in verse 44, reading to 47, it says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will rise him up uh, at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, which he save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. As we read this scripture, there is an unmistakable, undeniable uh, involvement in your coming to faith 
and you're coming closer to, to God uh, at his hand and his bidding. Uh, God is calling you. You cannot get saved unless God has done a work and is doing a work. You cannot continue in the Christian life unless God uh, is doing a work. And in verse 46, 44 of that John 6, we see, No man can come uh, to me, says the Father, except the Father which has sent me draw him. God does a work uh, in your saving. In verse uh, 45, there's something needed uh, and required for you to come to faith. It reminds me of Romans uh, chapter 10. In, in John 6, we see what is required. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. We cannot come to a God that we don't know. In Romans 10, it supports that very thought when it says in verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? There is a working of God and there is a working of the scripture uh, to bring you to salvation and to bring you to a closer walk. And we see that, that part of that work is done by Jesus Christ. In verse 46, they mention Jesus. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, that's Jesus. And there's an involvement on your part as well. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Just as we saw in Revelation 3.20, uh, there's a need to hear, and then there's a need to open the door. Uh, it is not a one-sided um, working. God drawing and God calling uh, and your response. And this does not end at salvation. Uh, it continues for life. God's working and your response uh, to his working. I believe that God uses blessing on occasion to draw you to Christ. But I wonder and I believe scripturally we can see that more often than not, it's hardship that brings us to that place uh, of, of hearing and surrender. Uh, Joseph needed to go uh, and be sold into slavery before he could be uh, second in command of Egypt. David running for his life uh, for years before he was king of Israel. Uh, even Israel was in bondage in Egypt before they could be freed. Even if you go even a step further, uh, as they come up against the Red Sea, before God could part the Red Sea, Israel needed to be up against it. Looking behind at the army, looking ahead at the sea, being in that place of hardship, and then God parts the waters. What a testimony to God. Some of you might find yourself uh, up against it uh, in, in recent times. Uh, but God, I believe, is simply using uh, these temporary things uh, of lesser importance to hammer home and bring you to a spiritual um, place. Uh, none of us would want to be up against the Red Sea but which one of us wouldn't have wanted to be there as the waters parted? I wonder if you could see, you know, fishes swimming along the edges or, uh, wow, there's this, uh, whatever. Uh, what, a, what a thing. Hardship. We see in Psalm 119, three times uh, in a very close span in that lengthy chapter, that the psalmist is really praising the Lord uh, for affliction. That word affliction is, means hardship. In Psalm 119.67, he says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. In verse 71, he says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And in verse 75, he says, I know 
O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. On occasion, God is doing a work and it hurts. Uh, but God is doing a work. Uh, and in, it's, it's for your better. In the midst of the work, I believe we have to remain faithful. And I wonder how many of us in the midst of the pain have lost faith. Um, what a shame uh, on the edge of that working that God's doing and bringing about um, to give up before God can finish that work. And today, really, my, my thoughts are to that one, uh, continue in faith and continue to in patience and part of the work he's doing is in you. Um, probably not so much important what he's doing in your neighbor. He's doing a work in you that's going to grow you, but we need to remain uh, and walk in faith. In Matthew 4.19, we've been looking several weeks, and we won't revisit it today, but when Christ called Peter to leave the fish and to leave the nets, he says in Matthew 4.19, he says, I will make you fisher of men. Did you see who is going to make Peter the fisher of men? Jesus says, I will do it. And when he says, we'll do it, it's a process. There, there, there is, it, it's not instantaneous. But we saw a responsibility once again on Peter's part. Follow me. Follow me. God calling and a requirement to follow in the process and to remain faithful in the process. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, uh, we see that verse says, Be not conformed uh, to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think it goes on to say that you might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. But they mentioned, Be not conformed. Uh, do you know when they used to make a coin, and still, actually, uh, in, in our, our mints today, uh, there's a, a tremendous instantaneous pressure uh, on a piece of metal. Back in the day, it would be a hammer, uh, and now I, I'm not sure what it is. I wonder what happened. How did that three-legged buffalo nickel get to have three? There was something that happened in the pressing. But to be conformed is instantaneous. And, and the scriptures tell us, be not conformed, but be ye transformed. There's a process that takes place in, in being transformed. It's not instantaneous. And we need to have patience as God is transforming you and bringing you through possibly affliction to a, a higher place and a closer walk. Uh, today, uh, I want to look at the ladybug. Do you have that ladybug there in, that we saw at the beginning? That is, two, those are two different uh, creatures there, are they not? One, one, some might say it's attractive, but I, I think that's an ugly, I wouldn't really want that thing crawling on me. Uh, my wife won't mind. Uh, I don't like it. When there's a bug in our house, those, those stink bugs, I hate them. But you can't crush them because they'll, they'll draw more of them by the, whatever they give off. If I have to catch one, I go grab a wad of, of whatever. I encompass them. I bring them to the toilet and drop it in and flush it. My wife just grabs them with her hand, and, and, and it just creeps me out uh, every time. I would not grab the ugly one. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind holding a ladybug. Those are the same, same thing. It, th th that could have been the same uh, individual, but transformed. Uh, a ladybug starts uh, as a little yellow egg. Uh, that yellow egg hatches into what I call the, the, the creepy, uh, that worm-like thing. It eats up. God, by God's design, the ladybug lays its eggs in, in a colony of aphids. 
That black worm comes out and eats up as many aphids as it can. Uh, it turns into a, a pupa, the pupa into the ladybug. And there's a transformation. And there's a process. Some of you might be that creepy black spiky worm. Uh, and you're not, you're not pretty with wings and red and not yet. But God wants to transform you. If you'll allow the process uh, to finish, I know uh, if you were to tell somebody, uh, God's transforming me. Uh, he's doing a work. I told somebody recently, God's doing a work. And I told them, uh, I actually told them about this story that I shared with you guys when I punched that kid in the face. There was this moment of, of I didn't even know what it was. Uh, and he said to me, he goes, you know, those kind of things don't go away. <laughs> I, I said, yeah, I understand. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of times you, you're managing. So you think to yourself, a leopard uh, does not change its spots. You know, I don't know how many times you've thought that of someone else or even of yourself. A leopard can't change its spots, and it can't. A leopard, it can't. But I would ask you this question. Could the God that spoke uh, the leopard into existence change his, his spots if he wanted. I believe he could. I believe if God wanted to, he could change a leopard's spots so he says, yes, I can. <laughs> God can do uh, anything he wants. He's God. Uh, please don't think that that which has afflicted you for all of these years, the, the fear or, or the anger, uh, the sorrow or lust or the, the habit that you've kind of embraced. You know, I've prayed and I've asked and it's still there. I believe that God is. Maybe that area is just supposed to be. Um, I want to bring your attention to a precious verse uh, that speaks of you and of the work he's trying to do in the, your body on this side of heaven and in your mind. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, the scripture says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. I want to stop there. I don't, we're not going to read verse 17. You are the temple of God. I don't know if you grew up in a church where that, that denomination called this room uh, sacred. Uh, when we were kids, we were not allowed to run in the sanctuary at Westwoods. Uh, when nobody was looking, we would sneak up there and we would have pew races. Uh, I think, honestly, a, a couple times over the top, uh, if you could time it uh, without falling, but certainly underneath. You know, three or four of my friends, we would line up at the back. We would look at each other and say, go. And you would crawl. You'd get wicked rug burns uh, on your knees. Uh, the first one out the front won the race. This was not, uh, in my mind, a, a sacred room. Uh, it's where we gather. And honestly, here, if you've got young people, I'm delighted. And not during the service. Last week, goodness gracious, it was loud. But I'm delighted. This is not... Uh, Sacred. There's a sacred function that takes place here in the preaching of God's word. But you are sacred. The things that you touch, the things that you let in, you are sharing space with the Holy Spirit of God. And to think that that area that afflicts you is either by God's neglect, I won't take it out. Or by God's inability, I can't take it out. That by design, you're intended to live life. He says, no, you're the temple of God. And I want to create in you a, a cleanness that's able to worship to praise and to be used for his glory. God wants you to be closer to you, uh, to him continually and transformed by a renewing 
of your mind, a continuing, if you will, in faith. Uh, God can do it. I met a dear sister uh, in the parking lot down downstairs. I think it was last summer. She, I was talking to several folks, and she came up to me, and she said, can I see you for a minute? I need to show you something. And so I said, sure. And so we're walking towards the trash cans, and she said, I need you to, to see this. And I'm like, all right. And she lifted the lid of a trash can, and I'm, I'm intrigued. <laughs> what's, what's taking place? She opened up her, her pocketbook, and she took a pack of cigarettes out. And she threw them in. And she said, I needed you to see that um, because I wanted you to witness it, and I need you to pray with me, and uh, I'll be praying. And some time passed, and I had been diligent in praying, um, and I know she had prayed, uh, and I met up with her a couple weeks later. I said, how's it going? <laughs> she, went, she went like that, and you know what that means. Uh, I said, listen, God's drawing you, and God's calling you, and God can do it. Uh, it was beyond her. And there's some things that are beyond us, but not God. Uh, and at this next part of her testimony, uh, I called her to make sure it was okay, even though I'm not using her name, and really to make sure I got the story right. She said, as I called her last week, she said, yeah, God did a work. She said, it got to the point where God did such a work, I didn't even have to think about quitting. She just quit. You know how he did it affliction. She didn't have to think about quitting cigarettes because all she could think about was trying to breathe. That's what she said. She said, I just, I just was trying to breathe. Cigarettes, nothing. I just was trying to breathe. She was afflicted. But she could, with the psalmist, say, it is good. Uh, there was coming probably a time in her life when those cigarettes would have caused a worse problem. And she's doing well now. And the cigarettes have been set aside uh, for each of our afflictions as well as hers. She'll need to continue to follow. But really, it boils down to trust. Do you trust God? You say, well, no, I just heard this horrid story where God made a poor smoker. Do you trust God? He's calling. He even now, something in your mind connected to your struggle or affliction that God wants you to get past for his glory and for your good. And you think it can't ever, it won't ever change. God can do it. There's a prayer that I found by a motivational speaker, Rebecca Jordan. And I'm going to actually include this prayer in my closing time, uh, but I want you to hear it now at, at this point. It says, Lord Jesus, I invite you to take control of my life in every way. You created me, you formed me in your image, and I truly want my life to reflect yours. Create in me a clean heart. Change anything in me that needs changing or rearranging. Show me areas that are harmful and habits that keep me from being all that you want me to be. If you choose to change my circumstances, those around me, or things affecting me as well, then I'll be grateful. And as your child, I am eager for you to do that. But either way, I trust you to bring the needed change into my life so that I can be more like you. As we pray a prayer like that, I believe that God, I wonder if God, because he's Trinity, ever says praise the Lord. Uh, but you and I could say praise the Lord. There, there's machinery in my shop that's very heavy. And because of uh, 
limited space, it's on wheels. Uh, I have a shaper, a uh, very heavy joiner, uh, several heavy tools are on the wheels. And on occasion, when I need to move them, somehow one of the wheels got locked. And you're trying to drag it. And, and it's, I wonder if God has drawing you to a better place to leave and to set aside something in your life that's afflicting you. And somehow you and I have locked a wheel for who knows why, a lack of understanding, a lack of trust, uh, I don't know. But, but God pulling and you with the wheels locked. We see this in Acts chapter 9 in Saul's life who will be called Paul. God working and, and drawing Paul to a magnificent calling. Acts chapter 9 and verse 3, reading through to verse 6. Speaking of, of Saul, who will become Paul, it says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. We wouldn't know it unless the scriptures told us, but when they say there, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks, uh, a prick was a long pole with a sharp end, a goad, if you will. And we see that Jesus has been drawing or really prodding Paul to repent from his persecuting the church and calling him into a relationship and a ministry. And Paul, as a stubborn uh, farm animal, kicking against the prodding of God, saying, I will not, until God works uh, really not so much behind the scenes at this point when that blinding light comes down and brings uh, Paul a temporary affliction, literally uh, knocked off of his horse, and we find out later that he's blinded by this light. As he surrenders and says, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Uh, God calls him uh, to a ministry and uses him mightily. What a shame uh, if Paul continued to kick against the goading and the prodding and the drawing of Jesus. Uh, Peter, we see God working so closely with Peter. Peter being one of the twelve, yes, but that inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. Peter being really um, a focus of Jesus. Can you imagine if you, uh, uh, May Lee studying the piano, uh, May Lee, can you imagine if you had three years with Beethoven every day sitting at the piano with Beethoven for three years, uh, and then you come here, and wouldn't it be odd if May Lee played chopsticks? <laughs> da, 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 da. May Lee, you've been with Beethoven three years every day of your life, and you, and you whip out the chopsticks. That would be odd, wouldn't it? Peter, in his, his growing in Christ's likeness, at the end of his uh, three-year tutelage with, with Jesus, not only whips out the chopsticks, but he, he, he misplays one of the notes. It was a sour note in the midst of it. When right before the cross, Jesus says, I'm going to the cross. And Peter says, no, you're not, Lord. I, I won't allow. He, G, Peter rebukes Jesus. What an immature, and really this is not the first immature thing Peter's done. He, he th throughout his time with Jesus, he's just showing immaturity, immaturity, immaturity. 
And as he's right before graduation, we see uh, Peter's immaturity in Luke chapter 22. This is a different account, but right before this, he has said, he's rebuked the Lord. And Jesus says in verse 31 of Luke 22, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter is going to go through something, and Jesus is telling him, uh, it, it, for in that time period, Peter would have fully understood what the Lord was saying when Satan wants to sift you like wheat. When you would sift wheat, you have a long pole, and you would beat it and beat it. And, he, and Jesus says, Peter, Satan is wanting to beat you and beat you like wheat. And he, he says the attack is going to be on your faith, Peter. But when you are converted, strengthen the, your brethren. I have something for you. And we see as Peter falls, just as Jesus knew that he would, from uh, that I will die for you, Lord, and denies Jesus three times, this must have been an attack on his faith. I've said all these things and I'm not. And in my mind in preparing the sermon, I, I know there's been times of my life where I've prayed and I've prayed uh, and not been delivered. And it can cause you to waver in your faith. God, you said. And it's not happening. We need to have patience and trust that God can do it and will do it. Do you have faith? Peter, further, I mean, at this point, uh, if you were to think of him as graduating from uh, being tutored by the Lord, really after the cross, right before the ascension, on the day when Jesus, before the disciples, I believe on purpose, because Peter has failed so miserably in all of their sight, cursing and denying even knowing Jesus. Jesus shows up on the beach. He gives them the multitude of fish. He's prepared breakfast for Peter. He pulls Peter aside, uh, probably still in sight of the 12, and he says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my she sheep. He says this three times. And he, Jesus says to him, Basically, I'm installing you to be, uh, in a sense, the pastor of the first church. Uh, the Catholic Church would say the Pope. Uh, you're the new Pope. And on this, uh, I'm going later today, uh, Chaplain Christie is getting, he said, installed as a pastor in a church nearby. You would expect the pastor to be spiritually mature, here Peter is on the verge of becoming the pastor of, of the literally the first church of Christ. And he says, as he's, the Lord has said, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. He, the, Jesus says, you, you are going to die for me. And as he says this in John chapter 21 and verse 20 to 22, we see Peter still being immature. In verse 20, it says, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, uh, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Wow, Peter, you baby. Why are you worried? And Jesus says uh, to, to Peter in verse 22, And Jesus said unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow me. Peter, I've, I've called you. I'm drawing you. 
and you're still worrying about childish and baby things. And to me, that's an encouragement. You think, uh, as a pastor, uh, I, I never do baby things. Uh, I try not to, but I'm, I'm continually. This morning, I said it to Brian. Something came up uh, this morning. And I said, you know, this happened, but I, I felt like the Lord just said to me, don't be a baby. <laughs> don't be a baby. Be mature. But we have these things that have afflicted us for life, and if we will allow the lack of victory to cause our faith that God can and will do it, it we, we will fall short. Not the Savior, but we will fall short. It will cause our faith which is the victory, to waver, and we will fall short of God's calling on our life. I want to end with a reading and then that prayer that I had mentioned from First Peter. I wanted to show you uh, the mature uh, working, the transformation in Peter's life. In First Peter 1, verse 3 to 8, we see the mature Christian where God has grown him. And God, he is following closer than he was. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in that last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, uh, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you can remain faithful, uh, there is coming a time. When Peter says, though you're in temptation or trial now, if you'll remain faithful, that the trial... Uh, will do uh, its work of refining. And God will bring you to that closer walk. And he says that when we see him, we will have joy unspeakable and full of glory. I want to close with that prayer. Uh, and I didn't have a chance to put it on the overhead. Um, but if you heard it the first time, and you want to be closer to God and surrender that thing again, believing that God can change your spotted life uh, as he's changed so many uh, in your heart just hear and, and in your mind say amen to this prayer Lord Jesus I invite you to take control of my life in every way you created me you formed me in your own image and I truly want my life to reflect yours Create in me a clean heart and change anything in me that needs changing or rearranging. Show me the areas that are harmful and habits that keep me from being all that you want me to be. If you also choose to change my circumstances, those around me or things affecting me as well, then I will be grateful. And as your child, I'm eager for you to do that. But either way, I trust you to bring the needed changes in my life so that I can be more like you. With your heads bowed, if you've prayed a prayer of surrender, uh, just raise a hand up and say, I needed that prayer and I surrender uh, something today. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, join me in a final prayer. Uh, Lord, for those that have raised a hand and for those that through uh, fear or whatever could not but they are at that point. God, uh, I believe you can change me, Lord, and there's something that needs changing in my life. God, I ask you again, would you bring about uh, this work, Lord, and, and transform me, God, 
uh, into something beautiful and clean uh, for your use, for your glory. Uh, God, I pray that as this commitment has been voiced through prayer, that you would bring a strength to our walk, Lord, a carefulness uh, and a diligence, Lord, to be in prayer and in your word and in fellowship. Uh, we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.